Hi, and welcome to the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery. Today, we are taking a look at Alice Pixley Young's work, and she's gonna tell us about her journey and how she's come to this place and the work that we have in this exhibition. This exhibition is Paper Routes, uh, Women to Watch 2020 here in Ohio. This is a partnership with the Ohio Advisory Group of the National, Women, uh, National Museum of Women in the Arts. Enjoy. Hello and good evening, everybody. I wanna thank Kat for that great introduction and also thank the curators, Matt Distel, Stephanie Rond, and the advisory group for including me in this fabulous show. It has been a real pleasure to have my work up here in Columbus. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just jump right in here. And show you the next slide. Sorry about that. Just a minute to get my bearings with this. So the first two pieces I'm going to show here, I'm actually going to go back to and talk a little bit more, but I'm going to just sort of show them on the screen here for just a minute, and then I'm going to move on from there. These are the two pieces that have been included in the show, and they are the ones that are on the, the wall behind me. And sorry, a little mask adjustment. This is all new, trying to make these adjustments in COVID-19 territory. But as we go, I'm gonna go back and I'm going to stand up and talk about these a little bit later on. But I'm gonna go back to the very history of my work and start with my first parts of paper. Okay, so way back when, this was some of my very first works um, when I moved to Cincinnati. I'm originally from Washington, DC. And um, I moved to Cincinnati pretty much um, in my mid 20s, right after graduate school. And in graduate school, I'd been a painter, figurative painter. So you can really see that, obviously, in the work that I'm showing you right now, right? Um, but pretty much what I did was a real, just a 180 when I started looking at a few other artists and also started really reading some books that um, had sort of significant symbolic moments for me. And I was reading. Um, a lot of fiction, a lot of nonfiction, and really beginning to think about the sort of cross section between those texts and my own work. And some of the things that I was doing was also beginning to bring in elements of my mom's practice. She was a quilter. And so I was beginning to take paper, which I'd always used, I'd painted on paper before, and I had begun to um, basically dye the paper and also write on it. So some of the texts that I was really interested in, in terms of um, the, wor the words and books I was reading, I began to sort of imbibe into my work, almost in kind of a practice of writing them and writing them and writing them and then sewing them together, but not necessarily letting others read them. They could see them as basically as areas that had writing on them, but it was not words that necessarily one could read. So up close, this piece you can begin to see has some writing on it. And sorry, my mask, my mask, my mask. Um, some has some writing on it, um, but basically uh, it's again, it's more of the textures of the paper together that one is seeing as you're looking at these pieces. And this piece was called Salt Fever. And it was um, from a story that I was, I was reading and it had um, some talk about uh, Lot's wife, and I was doing a whole series of work that was based on Lot's white light wife who turned into a pillar of salt. And so these pieces, despite the fact that, you know, they're no longer paintings, were still really figurative. And so this became to me kind of like, again, an element of figurative piece as it was sort of reclining against the wall. Here's another piece that I did at the same time um, called Shroud. Again, you might be able to notice that this is something that could also sort of hug or hold the figure. Um, I began, I was using salt with my work back then. I'm still using salt today. And I was using salt as both an element of the body 2000 years ago, but something that we as humans have used um, and is also in the body of the earth. We've used it to, again, to trade and to, um, be able to sell things, but also it's an excretion that we have in our bodies. And it's also something that's in 
the world itself and the earth itself. And I thought that that was a really interesting sort of metaphor that we have with sharing that idea of salt, both in the work of something that was both nature bound and also bound within our own bodies. So this is one of the pieces I was, I was really sort of thinking about. And this book, woo, this was a big one, but um, anyone who's read Barbara Kingsolver knows that she is a real naturalist at heart. And of course, this was really taking me on my own journey. My father um, was very much uh, sort of um, armchair naturalist as well. And that was something that reading this book um, was beginning to sort of, you know, really, again, take me into politics, take me into world history, but also take me into these moments that can almost not be described through words. Folks, I have the worst mask in the world. I apologize. Um, so listen, to live is to be marked, to live is to change, to acquire the words of a story. And that is the only celebration we mortals really know. In perfect stillness, frankly, I've only found sorrow. And I think that those are really important words to sort of talk about how both the world, the earth itself is scarred, is marked by our passing um, as humans and our you know, living upon the earth. It also talks about how our bodies change as we grow older. And those are something I'm really, really interested. The work that you see behind me is all about the body. There are ashes on the wall. There are um, pieces that I've made that are made from roofing paper. Um, these are things that also talk about the body, again, the physical body as well as the body of the world. This piece here, Bone Secrets, um, this was a show I had and there's a wire piece on the wall that you cannot read, but it is there, I promise. And it says, you have secrets in your bones. And this piece was my first real sort of um, taking over of the space as a sculptor. Um, again, I had really come from a 2D world. I did not go to school for, for sculpture in any regards. So this was my first chance of kind of like taking things out. I also had my first sound piece and I even had my first light piece. This lantern has followed me through almost all of my installations and you know, has become sort of an archetype, if you will. And it really does go to, I think, you know, my love of fairy tales and stories, folklores, and thinking about that lantern as a way of leading forward through the story, through the narrative. And in this piece here, I was using a tree. I was using um, these plates that were on the ground that were from um, my great aunt's china cabinet. And I was sort of creating this, you know, this, this scene here with these birds flying that were also paper, that were hand dyed, um, that were on the wall. And um, also with this tree that had been felled that was on the ground and my very first sort of sound piece, which was incredibly crude. I think I was literally taking a spoon against a glass and donging it like a bell with a recorder and going, is it recording? Is it recording? I hope it's recording. And so I was doing that for a while. So, you know, again, basic starts, but I think that that's something that I really began to love that element of sound and light and material together. And that is really, again, something that I find that we experience, you know, sensorily in the world and something that I also like to bring into my own work. I Am a Matador is another piece um, of my, I would say my collection of things that I got from my parents. Um, handkerchiefs dyed, putting together, pins, um, these words again. I Am a Matador uh, was something that I had mistakenly overheard someone say to another person and they were actually not saying that at all but i was just like when i heard it it's one of those things that really strikes you and stops you and it had nothing to do with me this conversation but it was one of those things i misheard and clearly she was not saying i'm a matador i mean who does that but it struck me as something like wow that is a really sort of like a power statement but also a statement that i think is probably something true that all women could say um, in a sense that, you know, they are daily sort of battling, fighting things. And again, through history as well. And so I had dyed these handkerchiefs and put them together and there was a little pool of red thread at the bottom of them. And this was kind of my matador shield. This is Nightfall. This was a piece, um, again, where I really started to embrace light and environment and really began to take over the idea of installation. 
And I was taking these birds, these were sort of the symbol that I was, I was using before in paper form. And now I was using them in this sort of metal. I was still using paper a lot and making um, different pieces of like sort of these crystalline shapes. And also I was using roofing paper. That was the beginning of my time using roofing paper, which has become very, very intrinsic to my practice at this stage. I wanted this piece, this show, Nightfall, to be um, kind of like a duality of times. It was both an interior and an exterior. Um, it dealt with uh, sort of magical realism. And in this piece, I think, whoop, well, we're gonna see it in just a minute. And the piece that you see that we're leading into that dark blue room was this sort of magical space that I began to use tree forms and these um, little hummocks that I had made. And I was thinking about this book that I had just read. And it was by Michael Cunningham, probably best known for the book, The Hours. It's called Specimen Days. And it was about Walt Whitman of all people. Um, and it was sort of in three parts, past, present, and future. And um, it was very much about Walt Whitman in terms of um, a naturalist, a poet, um, as well as sort of future times and nature and what we might do to the world. And this piece of writing really, really stayed with me. It made kind of no sense in a real way, but at the same time, it made perfect sense in a metaphorical way to me. And I began using it and I actually still use it more than 10 years later. This is something that still stays with me and I'm still using in recordings and writing on paper. Um, it's just something that is really, really, again, strong within my practice and means a lot to me. So here is Nightfall. This is the beginning of me really, again, doing this sort of more um, 2D version of tree pieces and which will later lead to the roofing paper pieces. And these are industrial felt. And these, in this case, these are, um, these are cut with a laser cutter, but everything I do now is cut by hand. And all the paper pieces, of course, were cut by hand. This was a big turning point for me. Um, at this point, I had been going along my merry way, teaching, traveling, doing a lot of different things like that. And I had gotten a grant um, to sort of up my practice. And it was a really nice, unfortunately, it's no longer around, but it was for an art teacher to basically um, do something with their practice that would really push them forward. And so I decided to go to Polchuk Glass School and I also bought a glass kiln and this afforded me both of those things. And that was when I began using uh, film more with my work as well as glass. And I wanted to use glass because like so much of my work that kind of is more about the in-between spaces, like not necessarily the object, but that sort of space in between, glass also has a veiling quality to it that I really enjoy. And also using this glass in the way that I was, I'm gonna skip past this and just look at this for a minute. I was using glass as almost a portal and I wanted it to be something that could reflect um, and not reflect our times. Very conscious of the idea of, um, you know, the hand mirror being a female symbol. Um, very conscious of the idea of, you know, vanity of one to look in this space, but also really trying to change that to allow it to be a portal or a reflection of the future. And this was something that was beginning to be tied with my ash pieces. And so I wanted to be able to use this. Also at this time, I had been doing some research and came across this really intriguing concept called the Claude glass. And this was actually something that was named for the artist Claude Lorraine, but it was because people, I think artists at that time assumed that he might've used one, but it was an optical tool. It was a mirror. And usually it was sort of a sepia toned mirror. And artists used it as a device to be able to frame their compositions when they were plein air painting. And so because those were sort of new things to do and very fashionable at the time, here's a picture, Thomas Gainsborough drawing, using this glass to sort of look over there and then using that as a frame for optical sort of device. And what, um, what they were really doing also was in my mind, turning their backs to the landscape and drawing from this idealized view. And I was kind of thinking, wow, that is such a 21st century idea of how we see nature. 
we go through looking through our phone screens and just, we, you know, I see people do this. We see, everybody sees people do this. We do this, I do this. But we observe the world through the lens of our, phone, of our phones. Um, and we give them little vignettes through Instagram or whatever it is. We idealize, we frame, we control that. But we don't necessarily engage really with nature or with these things that we're looking at. Because again, there's that separation. So that idea to me that seems so ludicrous that an artist, a landscape artist would turn their back to the scene in order to look through this device to find the perfect composition seems also something that is, again, kind of ironic today if an alien popped down and saw all of us holding our phones up looking at, you know, beautiful vistas of, of mountains, I think they would find this a little bit curious, right? So this was something that I was beginning to get very interested in, this idea of the clawed glass as a um, pictorial device for landscape, but also because it was used by the artists of the Hudson River School, which Thomas Cole was an artist that was working there and his view of being very, very, I think, engaged with idealism of nature, that was kind of a big thing. And that's something that's really stuck with me. Thomas Cole was a huge hero of mine as a child, going to the National Gallery of Art. I really loved looking at his paintings of these huge scenes of landscape. And it's, it's very, again, it's, it's something that has come back and been very much sort of informed my, my practice today. So this is another piece I did. And this is one of these um, glass pieces. Again, it's a hand mirror. And in this scene is a scene from the BP oil spill. So this is a video that I had that um, I made for this, this ongoing project called Will You Miss Me When I Burn? Um, and it's sort of in this body of work called Dark Glass. And Dark Glass referencing that sort of sepia toned mirror that would have been used as the clawed glass. But in mine, it becomes almost like, um, you know, a fortune telling, like this is what's happening in our world. You look at it yourself, but instead, you see what's happening in the wider world. Here's another piece, um, and this is a video I'm gonna show you in just a second. This is about, um, this is a forest scene, and it's actually video that I pulled from the US, I think US um, Forest Service about forest prevention. And it is something I have, I've used it multiple times, but I really love it. But then I took this and used this in an installation and I um, also, this was an installation, people could sort of see this piece and then they walked through and they heard this, this video. So in the next one I show you, I'm going to. Are there teeth in the wood? And you can hear that, those wood? words that I was using before, are there teeth in the wood? And as I was using this, I began sort of layering this voice on there. Kind of in a dreamy um, way that would sort of allow me to, um, again, touch back to that idea of not just the physical real forest and real environmental, environmental damage, you know, devastation, but also the metaphorical forest and the forest that we sort of um, also carry with us in um, our lives as our civilization of like where we began as well as where we are today. So I think of this idea of forest, of wilderness, of landscape as being something that is really culture bound, right? So what we think of and how we um, interpret being here in, in this landscape is something that's very much part of our current culture. So all of this looking at our phones and sort of again, um, taking in nature in that way is something that we do now. Of course, it's very different than how people maybe, you know, again, accessed nature 100 years ago or 200 years ago. So um, I sort of look at this as being something that is an artifact of our current society, but also really think, again, it's really interesting to sort of use these ideas and make them meta more metaphorical and less sort of didactic. So, after I'd gone to Pilchuck, I had another really, really amazing experience 
This is, of course, a Kentucky black barn, as many of us in Ohio and this region understand. Me as an Easterner, as somebody from the East Coast, I could not figure out why people were painting their barns black and what they were, but that iconic shape really, really stuck with me. And I was also really intrigued by this trip that I had made to Wyoming for a residency um, that I was spent about a month out in Wyoming. And it was my first real time out West. It was my first time driving out West. And it was also my first time at Yellowstone. And that had been a dream of mine. And I'd already been working with this idea of wildfires. But to go to Yellowstone and experience that just breathtaking distance was really amazing. And of course, wildfires, we have to understand, are part of the natural system of you know, nature. And there, of course, also can be very, like we see in California, totally exacerbated by climate change and by um, you know, human incursion. But in this case, I was looking at wildfires that were still actually evident from the big 1980s fires that had happened so many years ago. They had their, the largest fire that was on record in Yellowstone. And seeing some of these trees you know, that had been, were, were on fire this past year and then had been, you know, that were just beginning to grow up from the 80s, was really amazing to me. It was in you know, those terms awesome because it was truly the real meaning of the term awesome. It was so large and so grand on scope. But the thing that I also was really amazed by was that the lodgepole pines that were there at the, um, at basically that you're looking at, but were really this major part of Wyoming and also the Rockies, um, they have this two set function. And this was something that I found was really fascinating was that they have a regeneration feature. So not only do they drop their pine cones normally during the year, but they also have a secondary pine cone. And they drop that and it becomes this pine cone that will only open after it's been burned. And that to me seemed so interesting that I came back and I made this piece, You Can't Go Home Again, that was both influenced by the Kentucky Black Barn and that iconic shape, but also literally blackened from, you know, just being sort of saturated by burning. I wanted that idea of this thing that could almost have a second life. This idea, again, of being able to sort of um, go to the edge of this brink, but then also sort of be able to come out and regrow from it. And so this, this metaphor of the lodgepole pine having this two-step regeneration and having wildfires not just be you know, it, but actually these things will grow because of them was something that was really fascinating to me. And I've sort of carried with me through my interest in, um, in making these pieces. So here I used um, coal dust, I used salt, there is paper on the back of this that I wrote um, a lot of, you know, the words that I was talking about before that I keep on going back to. You can see the lantern that I have in so many of my pieces, as well as these hand mirrors with just a single one with this fire scene in it. And here's more of an up close version of that. You Can't Go Home Again is a reference to um, Wolf's book. Um, I've spent a lot of time in North Carolina. So again, um, you know, he was an author in Asheville. And so I was thinking about that idea about home and also thinking about that idea in terms of nature and that idea of, you know, the, actually the opposite. Like, you know, once, it's, it, once you do it, you can never undo it. But in nature, so much can be undone. And I find that to be a really hopeful idea that hopefully we can turn the clock back and so much of what we have done. Here's an image of another residency I was at in Hambidge, little shout out to lovely Hambidge in Georgia. Um, and they, uh, this is from last summer and these are some of the paper cuttings that I was making. And in these paper cuttings, um, I'm using roofing paper and the roofing paper I'm using uh, is it, you know, it's part of the petroleum system. It's part of the petroleum industry. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm using it is because of that. It also has this incredibly absorbent black tone and it is really kind of like, I really like to cut into it. So I'm using this piece and I'm making these elements of paper cutting. And as I'm putting these together, 
think another, yeah. This was a piece that I was making last summer for the Taft Museum of Art in Cincinnati. And I was trying to make a piece that would actually be a contemporary counterpoint to um, Hudson River School show that the Taft was putting on. And um, Tammy Minty had asked me to do the show. And so I was making this work and as basically sort of a symmetrical element. But these images of these trees had come directly from my residency at Gentel in Wyoming. This is the photographs that I had taken from um, Yellowstone, from these burned trees. I then took those, I then did drawings from them, and then I made them into these paper cuttings. And, you know, so I'm, you can see the sort of symmetries very off. It's not really very symmetrical, but I named the show Fearful Symmetry um, to make a connection between the sort of nature of this, also Thomas Cole's work, and of course, sort of a little nod to um, Blake and his poem. And he was, of course, a, a generation above Thomas Cole, but his poem, um, Tiger, the Tiger. And here's another element of this paper cut piece. And here's this sort of cast glass framed mirror piece that I um, have been making. And this is kind of a bigger one. It's covered in salt. And here I'm going into some of these pieces that um, I'm using these sort of scrolls that I've made with black paper. Um, these are all again from my Yellowstone experience. And I also made a little Cincinnati down here out of um, just things I'd found, cups, trash, et cetera. But I had made this little um, industrial scene uh, and then sort of again used video and used projection and used the shadow um, and used some sound and tried to put all of these together. This was, I think, one of, the, again, the, the times when I began to really put together light and projection and sound and shadow. And I was really interested in the scrolls, not just for what they were, not just the black tar paper for what it was, but for the way that it allowed light to pierce through its voids and the way that it sort of became this you know, giant silhouette. It looked like a giant um, Grimm's fairy tale illustration to me in a lot of ways. And I loved that idea of sort of making these huge Germanic woodcut pieces come to life like a stage set. Here's an up close version of what you can see. I'm sure you can probably pick apart. There's a milk carton in there. There is a, there's a beer can in there. There are some chopsticks. There are many different things, but I wanted to try to get this idea of a little cityscape. And especially since my adopted home in, um, in my loving Rust Belt, you know, city of Cincinnati, but the Midwest, I feel, you know, real kinship to this space because again, the Midwest is between sort of the two edges of America. And I feel, feel my work a lot of the times is also sort of looking at that in-between space. And so that's something that I was really sort of interested in and this piece kind of resonated with me in that way. This is a piece, um, another one, and this is where I began to take uh, this model making. I kind of went from that previous piece where I was using things like uh, milk cartons and beer cans and things like that to simulate water towers and to simulate incinerators. So then I began just making them with balsa wood, just really easy model material. And I started making these pieces and I um, put them, I was already using these uh, glass domes for some other sculpture work I had done a few years previously, but I loved the idea of the glass with the light. And so I put these, these jars, these domes, these bell jars on top of these pieces. And to me, it was really about sort of a mediation of memory. Taking these sort of 19th century items, which kind of, again, connects me back to um, my sort of, you know, Hudson River School, my Claude Glass ideas. It makes that connection that I'm sort of always going back to. And taking that glass jar, these bell jars, which are usually used, to, you know, to be memory keepers, I put in, by putting them over these pieces, I feel like I was sort of distilling that memory and it becomes sort of this mediation, this process of looking at it and distilling this memory. These pieces really um, were, again, 
uh, things that I saw every day, you know, coming from the East Coast, coming from Washington, D.C., where there's no industry, living in Cincinnati and living around water towers, cell towers, things like that, I was really intrigued by how we could um, have these inner landscape that were constantly sort of being grown again. Like we would have cell towers casting shadows on cell towers casting shadows on to water towers. So technologies sort of casting shadows on old technologies. And that was something that was really intriguing to me. So I was thinking about basically trying to have these pieces that would, um, their scale would go from small, from these sort of memory pieces to kind of large on the wall. And I was also at, um, adding in movement so that as these things turned, their scale would shift and it would change as it went. And to me, it was kind of like walking into a drawing, walking into a memory. Here's sort of a, the whole scene with it. I was using um, both projection, but also two videos collaged together, one of this floating water scene and one of the sky, again, trying to merge those in-between spaces. And here is a little video. There's no sound on this. but I think you get a chance to sort of see how things began to morph and to grow from those other pieces to this. You know, really thinking about some of those early forms of paper and how they kind of shifted to larger pieces of paper, to paper that had voids, to those voids becoming bearers of light and bearers of shadow, and then being able to have those pieces become something that moved This was a piece that I showed you earlier that was on the wall um, in the studio and put together with a cast glass, um, I call it a mirror, but of course it's non-reflecting, but this big cast glass um, piece right in the center like an eye, like, right, like an oculus. And those are words, again, I love that idea of portal oculus um, as being something that you are looking at or that is taking you to a different, a different time space reality. Um, this piece, again, was in this beautiful um, historic museum house, the Taft Museum of Art in Cincinnati. And um, it was in this lovely little room. Uh, and here you get to see how this sort of fits all together with this one sort of mirror right in the center of it. And here is the other side of it. This is from um, Albert, the Albert Mountain um, Fire Station in Georgia. And I took this video from that point because I wanted to be able to see, again, this very pristine wilderness um, from this sort of man-made structure. And I loved the geometry of it. And I am going to show you a video. This video is actually taken from my studio when I re-put it together, but it has sound as well. So the sound is something that I used um, some field recording when I was in North Georgia, and so it was basically was trying to capture uh, the birds that I was hearing in the mountain hikes that I was taking. But I was also really noticing that every time I was walking, I kept hearing these planes going overhead. And there's really very little area in this world that you can get away from seeing planes going overhead or ideas of human, again, human habitation. And so this video went and the, the sound begins to have a low rumble. You begin to hear a plane. You begin to hear factory pieces. And when you're looking at the wall where the video of this eye is, you're also seeing this doubling effect of this, um, this sort of cooling tower and this factory scene. And it is sort of splitting and doubling. And I wanted that idea of symmetry and going back to the idea of spherical symmetry in William Blake's poem. And here you can hear this. I liked how the fire tower almost looked like scaffolding. It was like we're scaffolding the mountains. And I thought that was really interesting to sort of have that again together with those pieces.
This piece was another, um, this is a solo show I had at Thomas More University called Transmissions. I have a whole series of works called Transmissions, but this was a piece um, that allowed me to kind of put together just light. I didn't use video in this piece, but I did have a lot of the moving shadow pieces and I loved this reflective floor. This was a space that I had really been wanting to get into because of its kind of perfect jewel box like proportions. It's hard as an artist to be able, especially if you work with light, to find a gallery that isn't light filled because of their windows. Mm -hmm. Rife gallery, um, looking at you. But really, this was a great, a great studio or a great, I should say, um, gallery space for me because I really was able to control the light and have when people walked in, they were walking in and becoming part of the piece through their shadows. Here's another view of it. And you can see the first version of this piece that I have behind me on the wall, um, Broken Utility. There it is. And it also becomes maybe a little bit more understandable because of the wires that are going across. That piece was inspired by um, the PG&E in California um, by the campfire. And, you know, it's sort of meant to be this sort of big power line structure, which was one of the elements that caused the real devastation in California a couple of years ago. So I wanted this to be kind of this derelict, decrepit looking sort of shape that was also part of this transmission series. I love this picture. This was um, at my, uh, one of my most recent shows in Arkansas at the, um, the Momentary, which is part of Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art. And I was asked to be part of their state of the art exhibition this past year, which was really amazing. Um, definitely just bucket list material. And they gave me the space that they gave me, the Momentary is a, uh, was a factory, was a, was a craft cheese factory. They gave me a cooling tower which was like 35 feet tall, but only maybe 10 by 15 feet interior on the interior. And the space was just great. I remember one of the curators was like, I don't know what you're gonna do in here, but I hope this is what you wanted. And I'm like, yes, this is perfect. Thank you. So here, is how that installation turned out. This was another sound piece that I made for it. Um, again, sort of using that, I like to use that sort of bell chime that comes in to these pieces. Um, kind of makes me think of keeping time, in a sense, marking time. Um, so as these pieces sort of rolled around through the space, I wanted these to again sort of talk about those pieces that I see in my neighborhood that they're really relics, they're antiques, these water towers, you know, these old structures, they have become the landscape in a sense, in the same way that, you know, we have started creating landscape, we started creating the spectacle that, you know, we talk about nature being. And so these things begin to be the thing that we look at, the thing that is sort of cluttering our, our, our horizon line. But in a sense, I also think of them as being the history of us and that they are there and that, you know, this piece is a little bit um, nostalgic and also a little bit, you know, sort of um, transfixing, I think, because at least all the little kids loved it. So you could just go in there and kind of hang out in that space. And um, that was one of the things that I really wanted was that idea of old and new being brought together and really, again, talking about the land and talking about the way in which we have these structures on them. And that, I believe we are going to
for looking at it's had a couple of different names it it had a name called broken utility it's been called lit but basically i started making it when i was thinking about looking at the california fires and thinking about the devastation i did a series of drawings i did a series of paper cuts that piece i think it was just so emotional when that happened and i think it struck people that you know had nothing to do with it um, uh, of course, it struck the people that was really doing something too much harder. But I think really all of us in this country recoiled from this event and were horrified by how we could be living in a country that, you know, is at this point of civilization and still be sort of brought back by Mother Nature and Mother Nature being, of course, amplified by our own human errors. And so I wanted to create this piece and have it look kind of, um, again, derelict and have it look like this cut paper was sort of peeling over. And I like the drape and I like the way that, again, this type of paper, this roofing paper allows the sort of falling and curling of the edges. And it also kind of defies wanting to stay soft and, you know, or I should say rigid and hard. It wants to kind of curl in and fall in on each other. And the light, of course, just amplifies that. Yeah. So we main the piece that is on the wall, that is the ash piece. That is the piece that is again, made of ashes. And when we're looking at that piece, that piece is really uh, all about, again, the void and also the shape, which you see a lot in my work in terms of paper cutting. I wanted to be able to have something that I felt was of the body and of the land also on the wall. So instead of just being made of, you know, this, it's kind of looks like flocked wallpaper, but I wanted it to really resonate in terms of a bodily um, piece in terms of, of, you know, this, again, this connection between nature and between human, humans being on the wall. And so that was something that I was thinking about it's that the, the damask wallpaper is something that's very again ubiquitous for sort of old fashioned houses, things like that. But I wanted it to have this piece that was made again as ashes, something that you know we see that it's carbon burned on the earth, our bodies are burned on the earth, and I wanted to be able to have that be something that could be on the wall, something that sort of resonates in terms of. Um, where we're going and our own mortality. We're here for a blip and then we're gone. And so I wanted that to really, again, connect with that idea. Okay. So thank you for bearing with me on that. I'm gonna turn the video back on. Hi, <laughs> sorry about that folks. Um, hopefully, we are gonna be going into some questions and hopefully you have some questions for me. Question that we have is from Barb Vogel, and please repeat the question. Sure. Is what type of black paper did you use in the Georgia residency? So, in the Georgia residency, I was using. Folks, it's a whole new terrain here. Bear with me, I'm wearing a mask. We're all wearing masks. We're Zooming. I have to use Google Meet at school, you know, just breathe, right? Okay, Barbara. Barbara asked what kind of paper I used in the residency in Georgia. And that's the paper that I use pretty much consistently everywhere. It's 
Home Depot style roofing paper. It comes in a big roll and it is incredibly stinky. It is um, part of, you know, it's basically a byproduct of the petroleum um, business. And um, it is the thing that they put down on your roof before they put down shingles. And the reason, of course, I like to use it is because it's part of the petroleum industry, but it's also part of the cladding of the places that we live. And so that idea of, um, of structure, that idea of cloaking or cladding um, protection, and also that idea of what this industry is doing to our, our land, that body, are, are all sort of interesting things to me. We have another question from Amy. I'm also from Cincinnati, and this work made me feel homesick for that river and the whole landscape. Uh, it's really interesting that this work is both familiar and revealing. I thought it was about the outer landscape, but tonight I heard the connection to reveal inner landscape. I wonder what space you have been able to spend time in during COVID and how your own inner landscape and the work that you make has changed or resonates differently. So, however you can. There was a long question and statement and it was beautiful. I really enjoyed that last one. It was by um, a woman that used to live in Cincinnati and doesn't and she felt sort of nostalgic and homesick for some of my work. And she was saying how she appreciated how it took her there, but also was appreciating how there was like an internal landscape. And um, the last part of it was asking how I, or what I was able to do really during the COVID period, um, since I wasn't out and about in a landscape. I think I, I captured that. Um, I made a garden um, and that was really, really amazing. Um, that was pretty much what I did. I have a beautiful studio and I did use it, but really um, I had a personal tragedy of my own that was COVID related. I lost my mother. And so um, I was really kind of not working in the studio so much. Instead, what I was doing was I added um, about three times the garden to my garden and it is really off the chain, frankly, <laughs> it's just wonderful. But my parents would have loved it. And I think that was a very suiting tribute to her. Um, and that is really what I did. It was probably one of the most creative and hardworking efforts I've, I've had to date because I grew everything from seed starting in February and um, didn't expect to do as much. And then when all of this hit, it was both a very happy and unhappy time. And so I just kind of poured that into that. Uh, Amanda wants to know, uh, the work looks really delicate in person. Um, how is it to work with? And also, the paper reminds her of snake. Oh, I like that. Thank you. Um, so she said that the work looks really delicate in person and that she's wondering how it is to work with and that she also thought the paper looked like smoke, which I love hearing. I think that's so interesting. I love any, you know, atmospheric evocations are always welcome bring them on. Um, but the paper is really interesting to work with. I would say when I was working on that um, piece that was for the Taft, I went through close to 200 uh, X-Acto blades. I did not get carpal tunnel syndrome, thank goodness. Um, but I did go through a heck of a lot of X-Acto blades. Um, and it really is kind of a, a great uh, thing to work with. Um, Roofing paper does not like to be glued. It will not, it will resist all types of, of adhesement. So you can really only pin it. So it is very fussy that way. But again, I go for that because to me, working, um, making the pieces is just as much about the material as it is about the content. The material is the content. And so using roofing paper, using ash, those are kind of requirements for the work. Um, so it does have that delicacy or that fussiness, but it also is quite resilient. Uh, Leslie Riggs would like to know what your process for cutting the paper. Well, 200 X-Acto blades later um, is I cut those pieces. You could probably see uh, in one of the studio pictures that I had, I lay out a really big long table and I have a, a series of cutting mats, those self-healing cutting mats laid down. And I have a big old box of blades and um, I just go through them. I've got my, my I just keep on chucking them into the, the dead blade jar. Um, I only cut myself once this summer and that was from being a, just a jackass really. I was just trying to pull the blade off and I was like, oh no. Um, 
But generally speaking, the cutting is very easy. I use those things um, and just cut everything flat. Um, and then, so I don't really know, you know, I have to kind of like roll it out, roll it back and sort of rely on my drawing to kind of guide me as I go. Oh, so Donna Collins, executive director here. Hi, Donna. Um, wanted to know a little bit more about the intersection of my teaching and my artistic practice. Um, well, I was telling my kids, I, I've missed my, my, my students so much. And I was on Google Meet with them because um, we're not allowed to use Zoom. So we use Google Meet uh, all this week. And I was just telling them that, you know, I could get a million bucks and I probably would not want to stop teaching because teaching to me is really half of my practice. Um, it keeps me going. It keeps me on my toes. I love the engagement with my students. But also, I think um, materially, it constantly asks me, because I get bored so easily, and I'm so lucky to teach at the school that I do, I can really bring in, you know, and I, I say, we're going to work with this, and we're going to work with this. And it allows me to constantly up my game and change what we're working with. And so the curiosity that I have, I also really try to instill in my students, yes, it is exhausting. It really is. And um, that is something that is that work-life balance we all have to do. But teaching to me is utterly fulfilling. I can't imagine not teaching. It's great. Um, and then, oh, sorry, I just have any more questions? Any more questions? Um, you know, I thought it was really, interesting how you brought in this LED light that completely changes the landscape. And it, what I see in your other work is this kind of like similar dichotomy of bringing in ethereal objects that require interaction. Like you have to have light, you have to have darkness in order for them to, to have that interchange. And so uh, hearing your, your interest in the naturalist perspective can you talk a little bit about how you have come upon those discoveries and uh, what you're pushing towards now sure so um just to recapture that cat was asking about um at how the light came in and um the led rope that i was using and how much it changed the piece and was wondering how i sort of came about doing that with other work and um, where I'm going with that. And so I would say the first thing would be is that the natural phenomena of light outside is amazing and it constantly boggles the mind what can happen with light and how it can shift the way we see things. So that added to a love of theater and a love of movies. And I don't love horror, but I do love the way that the light and sound sets one up for something. And I think that has very, very much influenced the way in which I bring light, sound, and movement into pieces because I also see how those things set us up. You know, as humans, we're built um, fight or flight creatures too, but we're built to really react to things that we hear and the way that we see things, movement. And so I feel like I'm tapping into this thing that is very sort of deep inside us. And so for adding this light, um, you know, neon would be great, but I also like just the way that this thing spools and also that it's this really, you know, I'm, I'm using these materials that are from Home Depot. And I like that I'm also using this sort of, you know, inexpensive light that's sort of coming around it, but also for a minute makes it look magic. Um, and when you look closer, you're like, ooh, that's not magic, that is plastic. Um, but it also has that quality. And so I think you, again, you might've noticed that I do a lot of things that look like stage sets and I'm interested in setting that up from the facade and as, as well as from sort of the background and looking at things in that way. So things I'm working on right now, I'm working on a short film called Tree Hugger, um, which is going to be, um, I've done these little videos of me hugging trees and they're kind of funny, um, but it's, so it's very different from what I normally do, but I'm doing that. But I'm also going to be um, working on a project called Ghost Grove, and that is 
casting tree stumps that have been um, cut down because of blight. So the ash blight that is in Ohio, um, blights and also climate change that happen. Been looking in Michigan and Ohio and hopefully maybe Wyoming next year too. But I'm casting on site tree stumps and I'm casting them in paper. So I'm gonna be using paper and glass and video and I have a drone and I'll be taking drone footage of the spaces where these, these trees were as well. So I'm gonna be adding all of those. So coming to you sometime after COVID. Is who and the what is inspiring you right now? Ooh. Um, I would say, okay, I can actually answer that really well because I've read two of the best books ever. Uh, Richard Powers' Overstory um, has been absolutely phenomenal, all about trees. Um, it was one of the most moving books I've read recently. And I'm also now um, totally crushing on Robert McFarlane, um, who's writing, um, I'm reading uh, right now, The Old Ways, which is again, all about land, all about traveling, these sort of uh, Bronze Age paths in England. But he's also written um, some other books, Underland, which is all about sort of caves and mining holes, other areas that I'm also really interested in because I think they act as metaphors to these spaces. And so um, Robert McFarlane and Richard Powers, my two authors of the moment that I think are fascinating and wonderful. And then basically just walking in the woods, being in my studio, sitting in my garden. Uh, Alan says thank you for providing the role as an artist as part of the women's dream students. Oh, thank you. Yeah, students totally inspiring. Um, so we'll yep. So I would like to thank all of you near and far um, that have taken the time to watch one more Zoom in your life. I love it. Thank you so much. And thanks for bearing with me when I was having some technical difficulties. Thank you, o OAC, Ohio Arts Council. Thank you, Rife Gallery. Thank you, Kat Sheridan. Thank you, everyone who has helped put this exhibition together. This is Alice. I say good night. Over so I can... Yep. And in case you needed more arts and culture in your life, we have um, a friends and family workshop with Charlotte McGraw coming up, not this weekend, but the following weekend. Uh, you do have to register for that one. Um, and then the week after that, we have Carmen Romine will be doing another artist talk. So. Stay posted on our Facebook and our webpage. And uh, again, thank you for um, tuning in and to the Ohio Advisory Group for partnering with us on this exhibition, as well as of course, the state legislature, which supports this wonderful space. Thanks and have a good night.